Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to today's session on the Air Invet project. Uh, we are here to discuss an initiative that, that's pivotal for the future of European industry and education. Air Invet Applied Innovation and Research in Vocational Education and Training aims to drive European economic competitiveness and support the green and digital transition. How? By promoting applied innovation and research within vocational education and training for small and medium-sized enterprises and the broader industry. Our project focuses on identifying vet centers engaged in applied research, conducting insightful case studies and de developing tools that empower SMEs uh, to participate in applied research activities. By collaborating with regional innovation agents, we are working towards um, a brighter future for European research and development. Today, we will explore how these initiatives uh, not only enhance the European economy, but also fosters innovation through VET. We will hear from experts, engage in discussions, and hopefully inspire each other to contribute to this exciting journey. So let's dive in and see how we can collectively promote innovation and drive competitiveness through vocational education and training. Let's see a video presentation about this project. <laughs> Did you know that vocational education and training participate in applied innovation and research activities? The European Commission has called for centres of vocational excellence to support local businesses in innovation and green and digital transitions. Our objective is to define the role of VET in research and innovation by proposing a European reference framework for applied innovation and research in vocational education and training. To do this, we will follow a research, development, implementation and recommendation process on how to implement applied research in VET. The first step for the mapping of applied research has been to develop a glossary and a business model canvas of vocational education and training applied research to establish common terms. With these tools, we are carrying out interviews to gather knowledge from different experiences, countries and organisations. From that diversity, we will identify case studies of successful collaborations between vocational education and training centres and companies finding solutions to existing problems. The second step will involve understanding the mindsets of educational agents, industrial representatives and communities towards applied research. Then we will identify the enablers and barriers we need to overcome. In the third step, we will create a roadmap for the centres to integrate applied research activities in their organisations, taking into account different maturity levels. This will be the Air Invet Applied Research and Innovation Framework. The fourth step to complete the process will be to facilitate interactions among different approaches. Online sessions will be done for partners and attendants from different countries to share their activities. We will gather conclusions and recommendations for organisations to implement applied research innovation activities. Through the Air Invet project, we aim to drive European economic growth and support the green and digital transition by promoting applied innovation and research in vocational education and training for SMEs and industry. Would you like to have your applied research experience within VET education showcased in our project? Join us. To kick things off, uh, please welcome Grégoire Deschamps fro from uh, the EACEA to talk about forward-looking actions in R&I within VET. Uh, Grégoire is presenting the take from the EACEA, European Education and Culture Executive Agency, and the relevance for the Commission and the positioning of applied research and innovation for vocational education in Europe. Welcome, Grégoire. 
first and good morning everyone it's a pleasure to be to be here thanks for all the partners to to be there as well and uh, and welcoming me so AK, as you mentioned is the uh, education and culture executive agency so uh, we aim to uh, promote and to develop projects in these two uh, areas via uh, yeah major funding programs so creative europe media and of course erasmus plus uh, for the educational part uh, this is for really uh, EACEA. So we manage uh, mainly calls for proposals, uh, and this is the opportunity to gather uh, such a um, wide range of partners uh, in a room, in a project, uh, and read uh, applied to the forward-looking project in uh, in 2022. So just a few words about this uh, important action, forward-looking action. Um, this is um, an action aiming to uh, foster innovation, creativity, uh, social entrepreneurship, participation also uh, in different fields uh, of education and training uh, in general. So it's quite broad action. Uh, now, when we reach the project level, uh, all the, the, the projects funded via this, uh, this action, uh, they, they are large-scale projects. We've seen this in the presentation, uh, involving different types of organizations, different types of, uh, of member states, uh, um, but they all aim to uh, develop, test, uh, create, identify some innovative approach. Innovation is really at the center of this, uh, uh, um, yeah, of this call and of these projects. But it's not innovation for innovation, it's also innovation uh, to aim, um, a, yeah, aiming to uh, to be mainstreamed in in order to improve really the systems as such. So the mainstreaming is important, and the European dimension, improving European dimension, is uh, is also key. So for the 2022 call, um, so we had 30 million euros of uh, projects. So we fund uh, 39 projects divided in specific lots. So the first one was about cross-sectoral priorities. The third one was about um, adult education. And the second one, the object of this uh, uh, project too, uh, was about VET, so vocational education and training, uh, where we had a specific uh, priority uh, that year about applied research in VET. So really for the applied research in VET, we, we fund uh, four projects. So Air in VET, uh, of course, but also Challenger, Barkov, and NIRVET. So those are the four projects that we fund within this specific uh, priority. Um, I'll say a few words about the, the, the aim of this project within the, the, this priority. So still the same, identify, test, um, assess also structures, mechanism for applied research in, in VET. Um, this, is, this is the first uh, goal, let's say, of this project. The second one is to build capacity uh, of these VET systems to undertake uh, applied research. We know that, of course, within the European Union, uh, the vision are quite different. What is applied research from one organization to the other? So put the, the organization and the, the stakeholders together and, uh, and discuss about it. And the third, um, the third goal, let's say, is to propose a reference framework. We've seen that also in the presentation. This is one of the goals of the, of the project too. It can be operational, it can be financial, but the aim is, as I mentioned before, to mainstream it, uh, um, yeah, the applied research in, 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 VET, in the systems. Um, just to conclude, um, this, this was about the, the, the past. We will speak about the, the, the current now situation of the, of the project, and each actor will have the, the opportunity to present uh, uh, the, the results. But also, I want to give some uh, pathway for the future also. Um, so I have the pleasure, actually, to, to announce that the uh, annual work program has been published uh, for 2025, meaning that uh, now everybody in Europe can see what will be the course, the next course published uh, next year. So it was just two days ago, so it's very recent. Um, but we dedicated 32 million euros for this uh, forward-looking call. Um, and also we have an extra 8 million for higher education calls, specifically one. Um, and we have eight topics um, defined. You will see that uh, in details. I will not enter into detail now, but um, we have several specific, uh, let's say, areas. So school education, the first one. Uh, VET, of course. The second one with vocational excellence and also joint uh, VET um, qualification and modules for the second one. 
And then we have adult learning and finally digital education. So I really encourage everybody to, to have a look and see if there are some uh, matches and possibilities to, uh, to submit proposals. The course will be launched, of course, in the upcoming month. Uh, it's not uh, directly, but you can have also have some perspectives for the future. This is, uh, this is it. Thanks a lot uh, once again. Thank you, Grégoire. Now we will speak about the current situation of research and innovation conducted in VET centers. Uh, our speakers will describe the reason behind the process and the findings of the mapping they carried out. We have with us uh, Inigo Araistegui from Technica, Jakub Grodetsi from Eurasia, Natasha Kristan from Sholsky, and Juan Manuel Mondejar from po Prohar Group. Welcome to all of us. Thank you for being here today. Juan Manuel, how did you come up to take the project idea forward? What, what was uh, or what has motivated you to address the applied research through the project? Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation uh, to be to represent here uh, not only Prohar Group, but also the Barco project. And we, we are uh, um, a company uh, that we are focusing on landscaping and uh, uh, urban greening in a city environment. So we are also part of a European platform for urban greening, which is a KA3 uh, action uh, Europe, uh, Erasmus program. And within that project, we are basically two different kinds of organizations, vet school and also um, uh, private companies in the, in the green sector. So the project is more on policies and the companies we found out like, uh, yeah, what about our interest here? Uh, are we going to actually do something? So the companies within the project, we propose to the vet schools to develop some innovation deep dives. What it is an innovation deep dive? What, what we did is to gather once a year for two or three days, all together, inviting also different other companies, other stakeholders, public administration, startups, gather together, and propose a challenge. Mm -hmm. And within these th two or three days, to try to develop by groups solutions for these challenges. And at the end of these two or three days, obviously we, won we, we weren't able to come up with a proper solution, but it was the first step to look forward, to, 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 to try to find new fundings to actually develop together a new, um, a new uh, solution to bring into the market. And uh, what was the starting point for you to take this topic on, on, on and further develop the relations between the ProHar group and the education providers? Um, for, for us, uh, it is uh, very important to, to catch talent from the bad schools because at the end of the day, in the future, we need uh, very high educated workers. So by working together, closely together, with our local vet providers, it brings us the opportunity to actually uh, identify where this talent is and catch it in the early stages of their education. Mm -hmm. Natasha Kristan from Solsky, how you approached the mapping? How did you find out the mapping results and what is your reflection? Uh, hello, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I come from Šolski Cinterkran from Slovenia and I come from, uh, so we are lead partner in Project Challenger. Uh, so the main aim of the project is to uh, to make uh, ecosystems for make, so we name them makerspaces, so to facilitate the applicative research in vet education. And at the beginning, we started with, with research around the world, so we made the uh, uh, best practice research. Uh, it was like, you know, what do you, every of the partners just made the proposition, what kind of best practices we already know. We tried to look all around the world, not just around the Europe, so we had some uh, best practices from, uh, from Canada, from uh, Singapore, so it, it's really worldwide. Uh, and then, on the other hand, we wanted to see what are the, the systemic obstacles and what are the possible solutions to implement application res research into the 
not just to the to the vet education as like something in the vet, but definitely into the curricula so the things can be really uh, sustainable to stay in the in the system. And then on the basis of that, we develop framework and the user journey of students and of mentors and uh, of teachers in, in, the, in this makerspace. And then of course, uh, we wanted to put it into the higher level. So we developed business plan templates. So it really can be something uh, tangible. Uh, and at the end, uh, in the phase of piloting, we really want to test if the if the all the uh, all the courses for students for teachers we develop that they are working and then what is in piloting what will be uh, all the systems obstacles and solutions what is possible what is not to see in the practical uh, way so that's our way of mapping and developing the idea Thank you, Natasha, for your contribution. What about your approach, Inigo Araistegui uh, from Technica? What is your reflection? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we, we did a similar mapping exercise yeah. as well in Europe and outside. But, uh, yeah, we before we started, we did some theoretical decisions, or, and so to call them, so... We decided to follow the definition of applied research of the OECD, which was defined in the 60s in the Frascati manual and so on. So we decided to avoid this this approach of saying, this is applied, applied research for me. We thought it doesn't make sense. It's already defined and statistics are made and so on. So we took this definition. Then we we decided to consider that or what, uh, what qualifies something as a vet center following the 2020 a council recommendation on vet so it includes a tertiary level as well which can be a bit difficult in some countries but uh, we decided to consider some institutions as tertiary education institutions as vet centers and then uh, we we took a systemic approach to innovation so we didn't follow a science push model assuming that it's basic science then applied research then uh, development and production then commercialization this is all fashioned we didn't follow a market pool model either that this you have the demand and then you answer the demand and that's innovation so we took a systemic approach which is more trendy and it's uh, aligned to the uh, to the to the theories our governments are following with the smart specialization strategies the national innovation systems the regional innovation systems and so on so, and within this framework, we carried out several interviews with yeah, with different actors in different countries. And our main conclusions, there's a lot of ambiguity in how we understand what research is in different institutions. Some of them refer to research in a very restricted way. Others consider almost any activity research just because it's different from teaching and so on. So there's a job to be done there. Then uh, we realized as well that uh, th you find more research-related activities when the EQF, the European Qualifications uh, Framework levels rise. Doesn't have to be a necessary relationship because you can have a, you know, a technology center that does research and is not related to education, but we found this relationship. And, and then uh, we, we found that many activities are not research. But uh, I would say that the most important finding is that we realize that the VET system really does have an impact in the innovation ecosystem, especially at the local and regional level. And, and that's the most important finding. Then there's the naming thing and so on. There's a more research needed for that. So funding will be welcome because there are more things to, to yeah, research. Thank you, Inigo. Uh, we have with us also Jakub Grodetsky uh, from Eurasia. Welcome, uh, Jakub. What roles uh, do policy and government support play in promoting applied research in VET and what changes are needed at the policy level? Yes, thank you so much and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, indeed, I, I will refer to what Inigo was saying about how we actually were shocked at the beginning because even within the consortium that consists only of a couple of countries, we could 
not easily find out the common ground of understanding what the definition of VET means. And as our organization is working on the edge of uh, professional education and VET, and I think we were also the cause of bringing those higher EQF into the project, because then we understood that many of our members, as Eurasia as Association for Applied Science in Europe, is having those role in the society as an institution, even being a higher education institution, to also provide those practical courses and sometimes fulfill the role of that. So our mapping and policy recommendations, referring to your question where we where we stand for, started with really understanding that the 47 countries diversity in our Bologna, higher education Bologna system here, 27 member states when it, when it comes only when the, it comes to European Union, it's, uh, it's, it's very tough to, to map out. And policy recommendations actually started from really understanding and aligning what does that means, what it can contribute to society, but also how it's understood by the society. So our recommendations, which we'll be concluding very, very shortly from now, uh, was uh, coming back from this diversity, starting with the position of the VET systems in the country, what kind of obstacles those systems have versus the normal universities, the comprehensive universities that are often in a different space. There are systems that are dual, that the countries have both VET systems and the university systems, and sometimes it's very connected. So, mm, so coming from that. Then the societal recognition and the policy supporting recognition of VET for the wider society and the role of VET in shaping and training and giving opportunities as well. VET system is uh, actually one of the main contributors of inclusion in our societies because it's sometimes the, the first uh, way and, uh, and the very practical way to gain education and then contribute to societal economy. Third of all, we analyzed the funding opportunities and how also the funding mechanisms are complex for the VET centers in the countries because um, it's way easier to speak, for example, with the comprehensive research, well-established funds and, for example, such a horizon uh, versus the uh, VET and uh, economy-related funds for those activities that are not so well-defined find because the definition of the applied research is not. We are exploring here this definition, that's why uh, this project also happened, because it's a exploratory one and I think the, this, this type of research will gain more and more uh, relevance in the future in Europe. And finally, I think the communication and visibility, like, so how society is perceiving those uh, institutions, those uh, education opportunities and why they should pursue those careers uh, was the part of the policy. So uh, was a part of the policy analysis, which, which, which uh, differs very much from country to country and we, we try to at least map it or at least ask the members through 80 interviews how do they really see that in the countries and the landscape is diverse uh, but the unity will hopefully save us here thanks thank you Jakub for being here and for your contribution at first thought barriers to research and innovation in vocational education include limited funding lack of collaboration with industries and insufficient support uh, for staff development. But I'm sure there are also enablers that involve a strong partnerships with businesses, access to funding opportunities and policies that support innovation and professional growth. To speak about this topic, we have uh, with us uh, Josu Riezu from AFM, Henning Klafke from BHH, we have also Oyer Uriarte with us from IMH and Maela Barson uh, from uh, Hansa Parliament. Thank you, all of you, for being here today. Josu, what barriers do SMEs face and what strategies uh, do set to engage VET organizations in applied research and innovation activities effectively? Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you, Alight. Uh, well, I come from AFM. AFM Cluster is the organization representing the advanced manufacturing sector uh, in Spain. Uh, we have seven uh, industrial associations inside AFM Cluster with more than uh, 800 uh, companies, the majority of them SMEs. Uh, concerning the, the barriers that uh, create difficulties to SMEs uh, to do applied research and innovation uh, through uh, VET uh, centers, uh, uh, there are several uh, barriers. Uh, depending on the country, uh, they could be uh, bigger or smaller because, as you know, uh, we have different educational systems uh, uh, in different countries and, and regions, and we also have different policies uh, uh, depending on, on the country. But anyway, uh, uh, we find some general uh, barriers, and I would like to highlight three of them. Uh, the first would be the, the lack of knowledge. Uh, uh, I think that uh, 
many times companies, SMEs, don't know uh, the benefits they could get uh, doing applied research. They even don't know that there are uh, vet centers doing applied research. And many times as well, they, they, they don't know uh, the equipment, uh, the knowledge that uh, the vet center has uh, to help them. So this would be the, the first uh, barrier. Another uh, important barrier could be the, the cultural difference that we find in SMEs and in, in vet centers. Uh, SMEs are very focused uh, 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 on the market. Uh, uh, they try to be quick. Uh, they try to, to give a quick response to the clients. So they are very oriented to, to the client. And another barrier uh, uh, is the limited resources. Uh, uh, SMEs generally they have uh, limited resources to do uh, well, uh, to do uh, applied research. Uh, I mean, uh, limited resources concerning fi uh, financing, uh, technology knowledge, uh, people uh, people uh, or staff uh, to do the the applied research. So these three barriers would be the the, the ones that I would highlight. And strategies uh, strategies to uh, to take uh, taking into account these barriers, I would uh, say three or three of them as well. Uh, first one would be uh, build trust, uh, build trust uh, between companies and 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 vet centers. Uh, open communication channels, uh, different contact uh, people. Uh, this would be the first one. Related with this, uh, with this uh, strategy as well could be uh, <clears throat> to see long-term uh, relationships, uh, not focus just in a project, uh, focus in a, in a long uh, relationship because vet centers has, uh, ha have a lot to offer to a, a training, uh, uh, to a, uh, uh, an SME. I mean, uh, they have many services, uh, they have uh, uh, dual systems, uh, they have the talent that the, the company will need in the future, they have uh, training for workers, they have innovation, they have uh, uh, research. So uh, this, if you take all this, it's a very valuable uh, uh, offer for uh, an SME. And finally as well, uh, it could be useful uh, to use the funding. Uh, if, if, uh, if there is uh, some subsidy that could help uh, to reduce the cost of uh, applied research for a company, this would be a, a very good uh, strategy to, to come uh, to a company. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your points, Josu. Henning Klafke from BHH, what barriers do educational organizations face and what strategies do they implement to effectively engage a small and medium-sized enterprises in your case? Yes, thank you, Alex, uh, for the question, and uh, thank you, Yusso. You just grab at, uh, um, uh, and <clears throat> the, lab, uh, the landscape is diverse in the educational organization, and uh, also the barriers in educational educa uh, organizations are um, very complex. But let me tear it down uh, on one hand. So work, the world of work is changing. The rapid pace of technology is um, influencing the work and influencing also educational organization. But this rapid pace doesn't count for educational organizations. They're quite stable. They have fixed curricula and they have different scopes and focuses on uh, education. For example, a university, they're focused on academic competences. They want to have researchers. Universities of applied sciences, it's diverse, more diverse. They're doing a kind of a dual study system, as you say. They do applied science, but does this applied science count for companies? And is it really um, valuable for companies to uh, think about in that way for applied science? It's, like you say, they, they don't have a cooperation. They have no collaboration because they see, is it really beneficial for my work by integrating applied science approaches into our work? So, and that's why I think the hidden champions of educational organizations are VET centers, because they have the responsibility, because the world of work is changing on the, for skilled workers. And it's uh, changing so fast, so they need to come up with all the problems, as you say, fundings, knowledge, all about um, um, uh, yeah, having the trustworthy setting and a trustworthy network with, uh, with companies. So I think these are the main barriers. But there are things, I think, um, and you talk about also enablers, what, are the, what kind of enablers we have uh, in order to um, get these things done. Um, the first thing is um, share responsibility with the companies together. Bring companies into the educational organizations and vice versa, of course, to see um, 
why not? Why shouldn't companies just give some ECTS points, so some credit points for studies, of course? So and this is what we are doing exactly at our University of Applied Science, where I'm in. We are uh, sharing this kind of responsibility with the companies and with the VET schools. We're not just having a cooperation, we have a collaboration. And we accept also things that can be learned on the shop floor level in the company, same as uh, in the teaching classes rooms of the vocational training centers, which are not only classrooms, they have also workshops and they do practical work, and we combine it with theoretical knowledge. It's hard work and it's challenging to keep up this kind of collaboration and not cooperation anymore because we need to have a lot of conferences. We, have, we speak different languages. We have a diverse landscape as we have addressed also in our project as we have mapped it. And so, but it's worth it. If we uh, share the responsibility, if we think about participation and also having open curricula that we are allowed to do it, except also we need to have funding and stuff like this. But these are the main things I would say, um, educational uh, organization, education will change in future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Henning. Uh, what about you, Oye Ruriarte from IMH? Good morning to everyone and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit, I'm going to focus more in barriers, but I'm going to set different barriers that, that I could see. First of all, I'm going, I'm going to say that we need qualified personnel for research uh, teaching. And mm -hmm. we have problems to attract this type of uh, people. Then we need equipment, and, but we need advanced equipment for working with SMEs. And then we need time, time for research. Because we are teachers, but we don't have time to research. So we need time uh, in the organizations to do this type of things. And like everybody says here, for doing this, the most important thing is the financial uh, resources, because this way we will have time, we will have equipment, and we will have knowledge in this type of things. Another important thing for us is the, the recognition of the ecosystem. As it means, uh, for example, for Euro European Union, from the best centers. And this way, I think that we are going to engage SMEs for doing research with bed centers. Myla mm -hmm. Barson, how can applied research in VET accelerate the green and digital transitions within European industries through applied research? So yes, my name is Myla, I'm, I'm from Hansel Parliament, so we are a network of uh, 50 chambers of craft and commerce around the Baltic Sea region and universities as well. Um, and yes, so about the green and digital transition, so actually that's a very important point also for us at Hans Parliament, so we are involved in this project and we are also working on, on green economy. And yes, well, I think it's, a, it's not a secret for anyone, but our society is undergoing a fast digital and green transition. It's uh, the so-called twin transition. And well, I would like to ask you questions. I would like to know how many of you uh, knew before just when they graduated what they would do. So as school children, what you would do in your future jobs? Well, I didn't know. And you know, now 65% of the school children will have a job that has not been invented yet. So 65%, it's a lot. And what does it mean uh, concretely? So it means that, well, you know, the pupils, so the future workers, they will need to be very agile because they will have to, uh, you know, to encounter some well, new situations and have new jobs. Um, so that's, I think, the important part for the vet students, that they must be agile. And for this, they must be educated in, in a proper way. So it's also going to influence, of course, the vet institutions. Because as vet institutions, they need to identify the future demand of skills, and they need to prepare their students for these digital and green-oriented jobs. And for SMEs, well, it's also going to impact them. Of course, it's already impacting them because they must remain competitive, so they must innovate. And that's why this kind of project, so applied research and cooperation between SMEs and event institutions, it's very important. So they really need to work together, and together they can accelerate this transition. And well, working on applied research within this project, I came across quite an interesting example in, in Canada, in the city of uh, Winnipeg. 
So the Red River College teamed up also with industries and with uh, gas utility from the region uh, because they, well, they, they had a, a problem you know, in, in Winnipeg. So the problem was the following one. So now we have electric vehicles. Maybe some of you have it in the audience. Um, and it's very practical. It's better for the environment. But back then, it was not efficient enough, and they had problems with it, and so it would, it's not sustainable. You know, it's not going to last, uh, because also economically speaking, it's not interesting. So they teamed up together on a project, and they say, okay, well, let's work, let's develop and test it a prototype, and try to ameliorate it. So to have more recharging batteries and more efficient uh, electric buses. And this project was a very big success, and well, in the end, you know, they ended up putting on the market and now people from the city, from Winnipeg, they can benefit from these buses. So it really makes a difference. And I think it's a very interesting example of how, uh, you know, applied research between VET and SMEs can be a game changer as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Myla, thank you for those uh, valuable insights. In the provided situation worldwide and the barriers and challenges vocational education centers have, how can we overcome them? Now let's explore some proposals that aim to shape the future of our and I invest and address challenges ahead. We are pleased to welcome Barbara Van Hineken from Catapult. Uh, Natasha Kristan uh, from Solsky Center Cram and Juan Manuel Mondejar from Prohar Group. Juan Manuel, I give you the floor whenever you want. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to do a brief presentation about the Barkov project, which is a, a building an applied research facility into COVIS. Um, so this project uh, gathered together uh, vet schools and also uh, companies, private companies from the green sector. So the goal of this project was to try to do applied research, combining the green infrastructure and the blue infrastructure in the city. <clears throat> so we, we understood that not only bed schools and uh, uh, private companies were the key stakeholders to achieve a proper innovation on the, on the sector. So we gather also uh, external companies not involved in the project, like uh, startups, with fresh ideas, with fresh innovation, which we thought it was going to be useful for us, for our challenges. Also, we involve uh, public administrations, because as a private company is involved in the green sector, we understood that our final clients, most of the times, they are those public administrations, municipalities or ministers or, or decision makers, basically. So we gathered all together and we in, uh, within, the meet, within the consortium and we thought, how can we do this? How can we gather all of these people? We took the concept of the innovation deep dive, I explained previously, and uh, we, we decided that a good idea could be to organize a hackathon around a few challenges. So we gathered all of these stakeholders for a few days. We did a pre-training before this hackathon and uh, we, we try to present those challenges, make different groups, mix uh, all of the st stakeholders in different groups, students, vet teachers, uh, technical people from private companies, public administrations, uh, uh, startups, and uh, uh, we work for these two days on these challenges. We identified four challenges, which was what we thought it was the most relevant for the industry, such as permeable paving, uh, soil and such systems, uh, pressurized water system, rainwater systems, and green roofs. So we divided those groups into these different challenges, and uh, we worked together uh, to come up with ideas. After these ideas came up, and these uh, potential solutions, each, in, each 
team in, uh, in, uh, in the different countries, which each team is composed by a vet school and a private company from the sector, we develop a pilot cases, one-to-one -one cases, we call it, so where uh, the innovation is created, is proposed together by all the stakeholders and develop with the startups, with the, t with the students, and also with the um, private companies. So, for example, in our case, in the one-to-one -one case in Spain, we, we propose uh, the installation of a green roof that we could actually measure moisture in the water. We designed some special sensors that we could monitor that together with the, with the students. We also wanted to measure the biodiversity that a green roof brings into an urban environment. Uh, together with the startup, with a solution that the startup uh, has, so it was a very, uh, it was a very um, special work because we had to understand everyone's interest and uh, try to collaborate with everyone's expertise. So it is, it enriched. I think, from my point of view, it enriched the students that they had a chance to actually see what a roof garden is, but also us to achieve some results that we could actually bring it into the market and marketing ourselves as uh, the leaders of, uh, in the industry. Uh, you can see, well, the results, uh, of course, we did some mistakes, which is fine, which is part of the innovation. Uh, we, get some, we got some conclusions. Uh, we discussed this with the teachers, and the teachers were able to actually introduce um, this uh, methodology into the curricula, which I think is quite good uh, for, as an outsider. I'm not a teacher, I'm not best in the vet industry, but as an outsider, I think it's very good for, for those students. So the conclusion that we got into, into this one-to-one -one case it's that let's innovate, but let's innovate together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Manuel. Now, Natasha Kristan from Tsolski Center Cram uh, is going to uh, present the proposal Challenger. I give you the yes. floor. Thank you. So we'll start. So, hello everybody again. Uh, so, uh, I come from the product, uh, project Challenger. So, our idea, so we are focused on problem solving approach, on knowledge, skill sharing connected to concrete challenges, search of concrete solutions for industry of society. So, the, we wanted to bring into our ecosystems in our makerspaces to so new agile mindset, new forms of learning, teaching, working, and new education and culture approaches and systemic changes of wet. Because we need systemic changes if we want to, uh, to have those makerspaces active and applicative research uh, implemented in wet. Uh, so at the beginning, I will present user journey. So we developed it uh, in the project. In the project, we have uh, six vet providers. So it's very focused on, the uh, project is very focused on vet providers. But on the other hand, we have partners with a lot of knowledge in other fields. So we could do things like that because, you know, vet providers, we have limited, we have knowledge of vet education a lot, but others, we really seek for other knowledges and that was the, one of the, the chances for us to improve us in doing uh, new, thing, new things in the field of ap applicative research. So we developed this user journey so the students and teachers and mentors could see where is their place in the makerspace, what to do, what is expected from them. Of course, we developed the education for teachers and for students because everybody has to learn to work active, to, to be a part of applicative research. And yes, we developed the framework because, again, uh, makerspaces 
the idea behind is very well known. We have a lot of good practices in different vet, uh, on different vet providers, but there are just the cases of good practices. It's not a system of a good practices. So we made all the research of the uh, barriers, of the possible solutions, of uh, what is uh, what kind of uh, things we can develop, so good cases around the world. And then we created the idea of role models, so the mentor, what is the role model, what do we want from them, how to act in the maker space. Uh, and then we made a business plan template because it's important to have everything on one place to know what to do, how to do. And we developed maker space framework where all the actors are in and everybody knows what to do. So, and the most important thing here are, it's not just one, there are more, but you have to have the strong support of the leadership and uh, you have uh, to have very strong cooperation but without leadership there is nothing to be uh, developed uh, and this is the scheme of the makerspace of our of our framework so we can see the how we are tending to cop to make the cooperation between schools and the local and regional communities because it's very important that we don't just do something you know for the business uh, don't do something for ourselves but we have to think wider we have to think about the whole community uh, because when when students are a part of the whole community i think that they grow and they they become they, they know their value in the world and uh, in time of uh, their being in the secondary school i think that the building of the personality is very important uh, and then at the end we want to test everything so every vet provider will try to build its own makerspace. It will be different makers, six different makerspaces because we have different backgrounds. We are in different systems uh, and uh, every vet provider will provide three or more challenges and then at the end one of the challenges will go to the main uh, to the main uh, competition, and it will be presented at our, at our final uh, conference. And we are really looking forward. So, first of the few of the challenges uh, are presented here. So they are really uh, interesting. The challenges came from companies, from local environment, from uh, NGOs. So. Uh, for example, I don't know, smart bike storage for personal bicycles. Uh, and you see, it's, it's really something that brings you, uh, brings some, I don't know, cherry on the top. So that's the, that's the, the main goal or the main reason for doing the projects and all the paperwork and all the research. So at the end, you see the results like this. Uh, so the partnership is really very wide, but we have the focus, as I said, on the vet centers. And I really hope that things will become sustainable and to be really, you know, developing even after the project. Okay, it's two years, but maybe we will, not maybe, we will be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, now it's time to hear the proposal of Barbara of Van Hineken from Catapult, uh, the Air Invet uh, proposal. I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here with me. I'm Barbara, I'm coming from Catapult in the Netherlands. It's a catalyst for public-private partnerships uh, in vocational and professional education. Within the Air Invet project, together with all of you, our partners, we developed a framework and a roadmap. Let's see. Um, in order to give some ground to stand on to vet centers that want to improve their research and innovation activities. Um, we based our framework on the outcomes of our project, our mapping, our um, case studies, our interviews with a 
really large variety of stakeholders within our network. Um, and within our network's network, we tried to reach out as much as we could. Um, and doing that, we found four dimensions that need to be taken into account when you want to improve your research and innovation activities. Those four dimensions are impact, activities, research and innovation in itself, and governance. Um, impact is about the why. That's what we start with. That's what a vet center should start with. Why do you want to improve your research and innovation activities? I think we heard many reasons here already today. Um, but it's important for them to know what motivates them. Where do they want to go to? What's their goal? What's their objectives? What are the incentives they expect from it? Are they feasible? It's very nice to talk about the, imp the desired impact with vet centers. Um, so when they know that, we can move on to the second dimension, which is activities. Um, those activities entail everything a vet center already does. So everything they, they provide. And that's not just initial education. I think that's the core business. Of course, we all do that. But also their associated functions, their academic profile, like the EQF level of their educational offer they provide. Uh, the skills, interne internal and external innovation processes, and the forecasting they might be doing. Because this is what we can build on. We already have this. So then the next... Two dimensions are research and innovation and governance. Research and innovation, we made it into a dimension because we need to see what are we already doing? What can we build on? What kind of capacity and methods do we have? What is our expertise so far? What's our e ecosystem? Do we have a backup? Can we cooperate and collaborate with SMEs and other stakeholders like governmental organizations, NGOs, and so on? Um, and of course, this can be very, mm, a, wide, a very wide variety too. Like the research methods, there's desk research, but especially for FED institutions, it's often not that. It's not that academic or theoretic. It's much more on the floor, hands-on activities. And it's very nice to see the wide range of um, research methods that can be included. Um, and also the research outcomes. They are not often books or journal articles in scientific journals. They are prototypes, proofs of concept, products, interventions. There is so many to do and there are so many more to develop. And then, of course, the fourth dimension comes into view, because if you want to do and improve your research and innovation activities, then how do you organize that? And it's very important to do that well. So you need to have a strategy that's embedded within your organization and aligns with uh, the policies that are in place in your region on national level or in even international level. And of course, you need to address internal and external barriers and enablers. We talked about them too. Um, the four dimensions are very much interrelated. There's no such a thing of a great new idea without an open mindset. There is no such a thing as a good result that has not been seen by anyone because you forgot your dissemination. We really need to see them all. Um, so what do we do with, those, with this framework? We are developing an online interactive self-assessment tool so vet organizations can have insights in their current state of affairs when it comes to their research and innovation activities. The outcomes will look like graphs like this. So you can see how you scored on different parts of our dimensions. Um, and based on the outcomes, you will receive recommendations. And those recommendations are again based on the results of our Aaron vet project and the expertise of all our partners and network. This is not a rigid guideline. That's important to know. It's an open living framework. We can add. Some vet institution will have specific context or circumstances that will make some of the uh, parts of our dimensions maybe not so relevant for them and others very relevant. And this can differ from situation to situation, from vet center to vet center, from region to region. And I think that's very, it's very nice that we managed to make a framework that allows for this flexibility. So I also wanted to say I'm very proud of what we did here. Thank you for your input. Thank you for, for your presentation, Barbara.
Taking into account the current situation and proposals, let's dive into the future. What actions should we take to have a future with applied and innovation research in VET with value for SMEs? Now, we will have a panel discussion to delve deeper into these proposals and joining us are representatives from Russia, Jakub Grodetsky, uh, consulting and representing Canadian colleges, uh, Diane Bird, thank you for being here. Uh, we have also Juan Manuel, uh, thank you, Mondejar, uh, Natasha Kristan, Josu Riezu from AFM, uh, Barbara Van Hineken uh, from Catapult, uh, Dirk De Witt uh, from ISO, uh, Maela Barson uh, from uh, Hans Parliament, uh, Oyer Uriarte, IMH, and uh, from Technica, Inigo Araistegui and Inigo Mujica. Thank you for being here. And we are going to speak about the participation of different agents in the Air Invet ecosystem, wha what would facilitate and support the understanding and engagement of internal and external stakeholders? So uh, we are going to start with you, Inigo Mujica from Technica. What would be critical actions to support teachers in engaging in applied research? Okay, thank you, uh, all of you, for being here. Um, Okay, that's an interesting question, and I think it comes well after seeing the framework that Barbara showed us, because I think it's very interesting uh, the role of the school management. Uh, here we see that, um, I said before also that it's difficult to find teachers to involve in this kind of project. I agree with that, but not in a hundred percent, because uh, I think that the school management has a huge role supporting this kind of teachers because we need to know that uh, we are uh, we are making projects for SMEs. SMEs demanding uh, one technological development or uh, some innovation uh, activity uh, to do in a vet center for them. And the teachers uh, are not used to do this kind of projects. We used to adapt to the timetable of the, of the company uh, it's an innovation project for, for the teacher. It's uh, very, uh, very interesting, but also challenging. And I think uh, the first of the first thing that uh, should be done if you are going to make, uh, if you are going to start making a applied research project, is to support the teacher that is going to be involved in this kind of projects. Um, first of all. Uh, I, I would like to, to say uh, how is the situation of the applied research project in, in, different, uh, in different ecosystems. Uh, some, sometimes the teacher and the students are, are involved in this kind of projects. So in this kind of projects, maybe the innovation level is not so high because there are also are involved in uh, the, the students inside this project. But at least in the basket ecosystem, the situation is that the teachers are the only ones that make this kind of projects and the innovation uh, level is quite high. So um, we are not used to do this kind of project as, as a teacher and we need a lot of support from the school management. And first of all, uh, I think it's very important to create a, a solid uh, process to, to do this kind of projects create a, a group of teachers, not to be alone. Not Sometimes, sometimes uh, there is a teacher doing this kind of project that, and he's, he feels quite uh, lonely because it's very hard. Uh, he doesn't have any support. So I think it's very important to, to have a support from the school management and then also create a net from different uh, bed centers. You, uh, I think a lot of bed centers nowadays are making applied research projects are and uh, I think it's very, very important to create a net, uh, see how other people is working, and, uh, and that's it. And to finish, uh, I said that support from uh, school management, uh, create a net, it's very important for a teacher that is going to be making this kind of project. And I think the, um, the freedom, um, I don't know, I, would, I wouldn't say freedom, but um, uh, yes, regarding to the 
to the timetable of the teacher, I think they need uh, some flexibility from the management, uh, school management team, because you need to suppose that you are adapting the, for the, uh, to the timetable of the company. The company needs a project in two or three months, and you need to do it um, by two or three months. And the teacher, maybe in this uh, period, needs to, to work a lot. So then it, need, it needed to be a flexibility inside the, inside the group of teachers that are, are doing these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Inigo. Uh, we are uh, speaking about uh, teachers, but now we are going to speak about the students. Uh, Diane Bird uh, from Canada. What are the benefits of that student involvement in applied research? I mean, how the institutions can engage students in applied research and how uh, can be better embedded inside the, the, the study programs? Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, I bring a perspective from the Canadian College Network, which is um, our vocational education and training um, system in, in Canada. And um, in all of my experience, because we are education and um, vocational education providers, our focus is really on the students. And um, really, it, I, I see applied research as a way to enhance the learning for students. There are so many benefits and so many, um, you know, there's so much research that's been done on the benefits for students. Um, when they're engaged in applied research projects, they're not only um, applying their technical skills that they're learning in their programs, but they're also applying their professional skills. So the softer skills, you know, um, the problem solving, critical thinking, and they, they get to develop those further, apply them, and the companies that they work with get to see them in action. And I'll share a little story. Um, uh, I, I worked as the director of applied research at a college, New Brunswick Community College, and um, had a whole team of a applied research team that, that supported students and teachers. Um, we had great support from our, our leadership. And um, we, I always insisted that our team go to our annual graduation ceremonies because I wanted them to see how our work connected to the students and how the students benefited from what we helped, to helped them to do. And one year, the valedictorian uh, that year, um, that student spoke almost his whole speech was about the applied research work that he had done that year. And he talked about the benefits. He talked about how he built relationships with the team that he worked with um, within the college, but also within the company. And then the ultimate benefit, the win, because that's what we're all about, is, is getting the students from you know, learning to employment. Um, he was offered a job with that company at the end. So those are you know, the kinds of success stories that we see. And in terms of how to go about ensuring that that integration and that connection happens, um, it, it is a team effort. It does require leadership support. It requires faculty engagement, number one. And in order to engage faculty, I think professional development is, is key. And uh, helping them to see how um, applied research is not necessarily a, an add-on or an extra thing. Sometimes it is, and you know it, you need the extra time and the flexibility, but it can be incorporated directly into the programs as a way of teaching so that it's not extra. You need to set expectations with the companies that you know this is you know so it might not be um, for those urgent two to three month projects, but if it can fit into the curriculum and they can align it with the learning competencies that the students have to cover anyway, it's that's a win-win for everybody. So thank you. Mm -hmm. We are speaking about the students and staff involvement that are uh, fundamental values of education. Uh, Jakub, how to organize uh, the assurance systems to support quality culture and uh, stakeholders' engagement? Thank you so much for that question. I think it's, uh, yeah, I'm going to go a bit theoretical here, but theory and something that at the first sight sounds often boring because talking about quality assurance as a system approach to solution for every problem is is very kind of daunting to to, to translate it then to the local uh, situation however 
I'm strongly believing that the long-standing quality culture uh, that supported many institutions to enhance themselves is a, a very much factor to, um, to 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 improve. And indeed, you said you said um, uh, asking me a question about fundamental values of involvement of staff and stakeholders. Uh, this approach is very much coming from the higher education systems that how it was shaped in order to facilitate mobility in Europe, how to kind of clo get close together and understanding what the what the quality of education is to allow for the free mobility in our continent, right? And there might be a set of standards and a set of uh, main issues for the VET institutions that are also able to be uh, connected and understand it in the same way. I know there are frameworks for, uh, for example, ECAVET framework for uh, VAT institutions. Uh, however, what is the really basis of every framework and the, as I was saying, like sometimes theoretical frameworks of quality assurance, what's the basis for it? is the stakeholder engagement in shaping this institutional uh, and, and also ecosystem around the institutions together. So by stakeholders' involvement and fostering this quality culture means basically the true involvement and co-ownership of the different stakeholders in our situation. If you are speaking about the teachers, about the students um, getting building the ownership of their own programs, of getting the future. We are speaking about the dynamic curriculas and so on. We need to discuss those curriculas with the companies, with the students, with the teachers and so on. Management has to have a direct contact to that. The changes has to be communicated to, uh, to show really that there is a mutual hearing. You know? And maybe perhaps if for our sector, that would be more understood as a common language of quality assurance as it's uh, well working in higher education because of the quality assurance roles, agencies roles in the countries because of the certain standards, maybe this common language of the internal culture would uh, kind of allow us for better understanding also of the role of the certain regional systems and the institutions there. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, quite a fan of this, uh, this, this quality assurance stuff because I'm, uh, we are directly working in, with on the, on the very European level on that. But uh, yeah, it, it translates very much down to the, to the, to the ground to, to what's happening on the VET institution uh, changes. Thank you. And about the point of view of the companies, uh, Juan Manuel, how can collaboration between vet centers, SMEs, and regional innovation agents uh, be enhanced uh, to drive economic competitiveness and innovation? Thank you. Um, for, for our, from our point of view, uh, I will say, and our experience, I will say that we need to find a common ground where we can promote a win-win situations between all the stakeholders. Um, of course, we think that's how our organization makes businesses, trying to find win-win situations. So that's our approach also for applied research and to make relationships with the vet schools. So it is difficult because that makes everyone to get out of their uh, comfort zone and uh, to get out of the daily daily um, tasks and uh, targets, but we as a companies we need to understand how educational education organizations works. What are their problems? What are their needs? What do they want? What are the targets? We have ours, and they do need to understand also what are ours con our concerns, our interests. For example, time frame. We have a different time frame than schools, and it's quite noticeable. And we do need to understand also that, for example, students are not available for certain months because either they are on holidays, either they are in companies doing uh, trainees or whatever. So by understanding this and trying to find win-win situations constantly and create a framework to be able to do that, we will be able to actually find those uh, little spots where we can actually uh, work together in our projects, get some fundings, uh, try to boost some innovation. And uh, it might not be perfect, the result, but it might be, but everyone will win something. And on that, we can keep on building up uh, new collaborations. 
We will discuss also about the measuring impact. Uh, how should we measure the impact of applied research activities within VET uh, on the innovation capacity and worth of uh, SMEs? Uh, in this case, uh, Dirk De Witt uh, from ESO, uh, what should we measure the impact? Um, well, th first, thank you for your question. And yes, I'm working for uh, ISO. We are the knowledge provider for the building and installation sector in the Netherlands. And say that maybe I'm not recognized as the most, um, uh, how to say, expected uh, participant in this project. But I'm participating, and I'm, I'm also very happy with this question about SMEs. Um, we are participating on behalf of the um, Technic Nederland, the business association of the installation companies in the Netherlands, and they are in the heart of the green and digital transition at the moment. Um, and to come back to the question, um, I think we should start when we want to measure the impact on, with an anthropological perspective on how to see um, that the uh, SMEs react on the results of the research and innovation done by the VET centers. Um, are they using the results? Um, will they come back to the VET center with new questions? Uh, do we see that the results leads to new services, new business uh, opportunities for them? Um, and we see we also that all the SMEs in the region, and this means the dissemination of the results is also very important, see we that other SMEs in the region um, also start going to the VET center with their questions on, hey, help me with this problem, uh, to solve this problem. Um, at the same time, um, measurement should also be done in figures because that helps uh, to give more yeah, concrete feeling by what's happening. So I would also say start with uh, yeah, focusing on economical things, on um, the growth of the SMEs that are involved in, in the R&I projects. Um, and that means that when a VET center starts with doing research and innovation, it should also create, um, yeah, have a, a common understanding of the, of the um, a reference point. How is the economy going in our region for the, yeah, for the sector we are focusing on? And then over years, they can uh, also do uh, yeah, some measurement of the growth in SMEs, but not in one SME, but because one SME for economic growth is, is too less. So I would say, um, yeah, when there are a lot of projects, you can also make some economic figures, some business growth figures, some, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know, there are a lot of figures to, to define. Um, but I would prefer to start with the anthropological perspective because that's easy to, to measure. It um, can be done directly after the first project and it gives directly feedback to improve the uh, R&I activities of the VET Center. Thank you. Thank you. And what approaches uh, can be taken to foster a culture of innovation within VET uh, institutions and among uh, students and uh, staff, Josu? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> how to create a culture of uh, innovation in VET Centers. Uh, there are several reports uh, that talk about the, this issue. And uh, they they give us some some good solutions that I will I will mention some of them. Eh? For example, uh, a vet center could could include in in their strategy the the concept of uh, innovation. That could be a good a good way. Another way could be as well uh, to train uh, teachers and train uh, uh, school staff uh, in, in in innovation. We could also redesign the curriculums. Uh, we could innovate as well in learning processes. Uh, we could uh, encourage or give rewards to the innovation. Uh, we could also invest or we could, we could allocate more time uh, to do innovation. We could invest uh, uh, in more staff, uh, in equipment. We could, we could invest as well in, in staff with experience in, uh, in innovation. You know, all these solutions, I think, uh, they, are, they are fine. But I would like to focus in one idea, in one idea that, uh, in my, from my point, point of view, could be also interesting. Uh, I, I think the proximity is a good, uh, a good solution. Proximity uh, between VET and, and SMEs, and not, I, I don't mean pr uh, physical proximity, I mean, I mean proximity 
in terms, in terms of uh, reducing the gap that we find between SMEs and, and vet centers. Uh, uh, SMEs ha, uh, have uh, their own needs, uh, technological needs and uh, skill needs, and uh, we need that the uh, SMEs are as close uh, as, as SMEs as, uh, I mean, the pet centers are, are, are as close as, uh, as SMEs as possible. Uh, we need to, to create bridges between both uh, walls uh, and uh, uh, communication channels, uh, uh, build relationships, uh, and this is, uh, this is important because uh, if SMEs and VET uh, know each other, uh, if uh, uh, teachers uh, uh, know the problems of, uh, of companies and they help them doing projects, uh, they start innovating, uh, they get knowledge, and this knowledge uh, through the teachers uh, will be transferred to, to the students. So uh, I think this is a win-win uh, relationship. No? If uh, SMEs and, and VET centers uh, are uh, collaborating, this is a win-win relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Henning Klafke from uh, BHH. Uh, we are speaking about measuring impact. How can VET programs align their curricula with uh, current and future industry needs through applied research? And in what ways can applied re research in VET uh, help address current uh, skills gaps in the labor market, particularly in high demand sectors? I would say measuring through transparency. And uh, what I mean with this is we have seen two really good examples. The Barkov project with this green project they're bringing into the classroom and also the Challenger projects, bringing the challenges of the companies into the classroom. And I think to do it in a transparent way, the learning process, the research learning process you're talking about, Diane, about um, how students will learn, it must be transparent. It must be, uh, the company should see um, how also VET institution has changed. Of course, 80% of uh, the classroom education is still very instructional and we can't afford to bring everything to a project. But do it once a year or twice a year uh, by just um, saying we take these kind of challenges serious. And we are, have, research learning is serious learning. It's not just having a project and you do just some, some kind of things. It's serious things, what we're addressing. And this is also what we're facing in, uh, in Germany. We're doing a collaboration, the dual system and the VET system. Uh, we're doing it since 500 years together with companies. And they have, uh, I talked about the shared responsibility we have in Germany. I think this is the key element. And what we have done now with this framework, and Aaron Wett, you showed, Barbara, it was uh, that we have now, um, it's not a rigid guideline, but it's a framework. You can self-assess yourself where you want to go with this kind of strategy. And in order to build this kind of relationship, to intense this kind of relationship with, uh, with company, you need to be... Um, open-minded, this is one thing, but you need to have open curricula to do it. So maybe once a year, twice a year, do these kind of projects, tell and talk and disseminate these results in your network, in your regional network, and you will see some company says, wow, this I, VET centers are capable of doing this, so let's do this together. And I think it's not about measuring, just bring it out, show it in a transparent way what uh, educational organizations are capable of. And the companies, they have a lot of challenges. For example, at our university, we have one year, we have uh, a validation of practice, we call it. It's research learning. The students came up with the questions from the company to us, and we reflect it. We're working on it on a theoretical base by bringing in also academic skills to solve these problems. I always ask the companies, why are you seeking for bachelors? Why are you doing this? You need skilled worker, of course, but also bachelors because they need to ha know how to do, um, uh, have reflection on the sources, on the literature, and they need to have um, a scientific perspective to solve problems in a way also uh, VET occupations have changed. When you think about complex occupations, they have a lot of technologies, it doesn't help anymore just to think about VET. We need new competencies. So transparency is one answer to it. Thank you. And Diane, how important is international cooperation in advancing applied uh, research in VET? And how can we strengthen cross-border collaborations? Thank you for that question. Um, 
it's very important, and I'll, I'll highlight three, um, I th guess, three important reasons for international collaboration. And I liked how Henning referred earlier to collaboration as opposed to cooperation, um, because I think that's really the key. Um, so first of all, um, you know, the one, first reason is, as we all know, more heads are better than one. So, you know, the more input and the more perspectives you have, um, the, the better the results will be. So very simply, collaboration in general is, is important. Um, secondly, um, many VET institutions, and particularly colleges in Canada, are very focused on internationalization right now. Um, it's, it's a really big part of strategic plans, and how do we look at um, you know, our faculty and our students and engage them in those kinds of um, international opportunities. It's, it's about you know, learning more about diversity, um, you know, uh, global change, and you know, what's happening across the world. So that's really, really important. Um, international collaboration can help, um, sorry, can help with um, um, problem solving and looking at things from different ways. So that's, that's key. One way to do that, um, I think, is through projects like this, um, you know, where you get different organizations together to work together and collaborate. And, um, and, and a, a really, um, popular uh, approach right now is something called COIL, which stands for Collaborative Online Learning. And that, I think, is a great way to engage in, in applied research um, in, in any kind of learning um, way, actually. But um, it, it kind of um, it takes away the, the cost. So it's more accessible for students and faculty to engage internationally when they're doing something in an online, you know, a distance uh, format. So there are, I think, lots of ways to work through, um, through COIL to bring diversity to the teams. It, it brings, um, it helps students learn from different perspectives and, and you know, exposes them to a world beyond maybe what they could potentially see um, if, if they can't travel. So I think those are, those are some ways to do it and uh, hope that answers the question. Thanks. Mm, thank you, Diane. And uh, now looking ahead, uh, what vision do you believe uh, Inigo from uh, Technica in regarding the role of applied research in VET uh, over the next uh, decade and what key milestones uh, should we aim for? Okay, so that's the easiest question it seems. Uh, well, most of the things I can, I can say are already covered, so I'm not going to repeat things. But I think that uh, there's something very important here for policy makers to realize. They are talking about innovation systems in the last 20 or 30 years, at least in Europe. I have the feeling like system is becoming a buzzword that no one understands. They, they, they are just using it because it's trendy to talk about systems, ecosystems, and so on. So the first thing is to reflect on that and understand that a system in the end is a group of actors that have different functions that are carrying out a, a specific actions, and then they do have some relationships among themselves, and as, as a system, they produce some outputs. If we are discussing innovation, they produce innovation. But that, that's the idea of a system. So uh, in this sense, they have uh, some very uh, serious um, um, uh, mistakes because they are ignoring part of the actors. And uh, they, they are not understanding that one thing is to invent something and a different thing is to, to, to spread something that is new. And the spreading the new part is the innovation part, not the inventing part. The inventing part is important, but nothing happens economically until the new thing is spread in society. That's a, so certain things they need to understand. The same goes for knowledge. Knowledge generation, and knowledge is a very broad term. There are very different types of knowledge, and some of them are very important for the economy, like knowing how to do things, knowing who to contact to do things, and so on. Not everything is knowing why something happens or, so, or knowing wh what something is that is more or less the, the, <laughs> the fortress of the university and the academia, which is important, but the, the diffusion of knowledge is important as well, and, and that's more on the VET side then uh, they tend to be very focused on scientists and engineers and you know, cutting-edge re uh, cutting researchers and so on. 
but uh, nothing will happen with these people alone. They are important, but uh, if we don't involve regular workers and so on, you won't expect much innovation to happen in your region. That's obvious, I think. Then uh, they tend to be very focused on the frontiers of knowledge, which is nice, but uh, you can have an excellent uh, researcher in, I don't know, uh, apply, uh, pff, let's say something trendy, artificial intelligence, but uh, you still have a lot of legacy sectors, a lot of traditional industries that are more related to BET. And, you know, I mean, these frontiers of the knowledge are great and they can bring a lot of potential benefits in the future. But right now you have how many SMEs at the European level working in more traditional sectors and we, we still need them and we need them to be competitive. So that's a reality of every region in Europe. And then uh, they tend to reflect as well, or they have to reflect as well on the model, because uh, in systemic terms, and I mean, social researchers know it from years, but the uh, uh, innovation is about uh, learning interactions within an ecosystem. It's all about knowledge. The knowledge is the business, and how you spread this knowledge, and who has this knowledge, and what you can do with the knowledge. That's, that's the game, more or less, with innovation. And uh, they tend to be uh, following a very uh, old-fashioned model of uh, funding science, and then this will somehow become a useful product in the future, or these kind of things, which are important for the system. But uh, they have to understand as well that there's uh, a lot of things that happen by, uh, as uh, Lundwall and other researchers say, by doing, by using, by interacting, and so on. And they do have a very huge economic impact. And then uh, it has been mentioned, but uh, VET can can do uh, all the all these things that tend to be ignored in most of the uh, regional policies. The vet centers can be very good in not in inventing things, but in spreading the new things, and not perhaps in generating new knowledge, but in diffusing it and in working with not with scientists perhaps, but with other types of technicians that we need, <laughs> and working with more traditional sectors and and yeah and working with SMEs instead of perhaps the most advanced companies that don't necessarily need our assistance. And then uh, one thing that uh, VET, uh, well, two things that vet centers can do great, I think, is one is, and we've seen examples of that, is to work as a boundary spanner, so to work on the to overcome the limits between different actors, because different actors have different goals. Companies want to make profit, researchers want to publish papers, and then you have BET, which can be in an interesting middle position and can work as a boundary spanner. So that's interesting as well, because it's difficult to understand how the academia will do it. I mean, if you are working for the academia, it can be counterproductive for your career to focus on your local ecosystem instead of your papers and so on. So uh, that's a fact. And then uh, uh, another thing that uh, vet centers are doing great, and it's a, a, a very important thing that tends to be ignored as well, is uh, to have an impact at the local level. And the local level is very important. Everyone discusses the national level and the regional level, and no one talks, or it's not true that not one talk, to, no one talks about it, but the local level is very important. And uh, universities and academia and so on are better working at either regional or national or even international levels. But having an impact at the local level, because you train the students of your town and you, you <laughs> re or upskill the workers of the factories of your surroundings and so on, this, this can be the right type of actor. So uh, I think that uh, looking forward, apart from uh, all the things that have been said, is that uh, policy makers should, should uh, stop and reflect about the role of VET in the innovation ecosystem. Because it has a role. Thank you, Inigo. Uh, what considerations should be made regarding intellectual property rights and uh, commercializing research outcomes from VIT uh, applied research? I will address it to the answer I had before. It's transparency. And uh, I'm a professor at a university. Of course, we are seeking for papers and bringing up our career. This is one thing. But uh, I think... As a professor for computer science, I say public money, public code. And as we see from the project here, also in Germany, if you get funded, public funded, 
it should be open. So open access strategies, strategies are very, very necessary for when we think on the level of um, the projects we are doing. But now we come to this point again, to the challenges we were talking about bringing in the topics of the companies inside our classroom. So what is the intellectual property rights then? Of course you can bring it out in a transparent way. And also the world of work has changed. For example, in our classroom, it's about 20, 25 students we, I have in my classroom. They're um, working at a company because they're apprentices there and also students. So they're working in the company, they're bringing in their challenges. It's uh, their banks, their insurance companies, their IT companies, and they're bringing up different issues. And the companies told me, Yes, please share all these experience inside your classroom because I want that my students getting, are gaining more competence and they want to see what other companies are dealing with these kind of problems and what is the solution out of it. They learn and they address the, the same point. So while we're doing this kind of rotation, while we're talking about these um, issues the companies have, they learn and they gain experience. So. No way to uh, so just saying these are intellectual property rights and we will have uh, uh, close disclosures or NDAs or something like that. We don't need um, in terms of education. But of course, sometimes a company said, yeah, but these are our data, our client data. You can't use them. Of course, we won't publish the client data. But when we think about projects like you did in the Challenges Project by having just um, application or, or uh, solving one problem, it's not about data. It's just about the process and gaining competence. So we should go, f like also the project, go open access, go for open educational resources, bring this out, disseminate these results. They are good impulses for other VET institutions um, to work with these kind of um, yeah, workshop, bar camps, uh, doing these open projects you have seen. I think this should be disseminated in a very, very open way. And I think nowadays, also, as I, as I told, and maybe you correct me also, but I think companies, they say, yeah, please share it and don't keep it just under, under the hood. Barbara, how can we ensure that the tools and resources developed uh, by your project are accessible and beneficial for, uh, to SMEs uh, across different regions in Europe? Yeah, I think uh, we mentioned it before. I think uh, on a national level, there's a lot of public-private partnerships in place already. And on an international level, there's also centers of vocational excellence. And I think the future education should be in public-private partnerships or in um, centers of vocational excellence, since the collaboration between institutions for vet education and SMEs and possibly other stakeholders um, makes us part of an open innovation <laughs> network, makes us part, being part of being this bunch of people that know what they're talking about, and it makes it allows for smooth dissemination of what we are doing and of making visible our um, results of the research and innovation um, processes and projects we're in, which is also very inspiring for others. And I think that's, that's the, the spiral that we want to um, instigate. We want, want that to become bigger and bigger. It's a movement. international cooperation in advancing applied research in VET, and uh, how can we strengthen cross-border collaborations? Yes, so, well, I think Diane answered this question uh, perfectly before, so again, I, I'm not going to repeat it, but uh, what is also interesting in international cooperation, it's, it gives you al also you know, knowledge in different languages. And that's, uh, I think, the perfect transition also to the question, how can we ensure that the tools we develop in the project uh, will be used in the future and will be visible. So being in this kind of project, international project, it's also a very good opportunity to develop those tools in different languages. And that's what we are going to do with ANVET. So we will have the roadmap in Dutch, in German, in Spanish, um, in Basque, and of course in English. And um, yes, then I also like to think, you know, that the project is never really ending. Um, of course, the funding isn't ending. Uh, people are starting other projects, are continuing doing their, their job. But uh, I think it's also a responsibility of the partners that beyond the project, we are still talking about it. Because I think we all learned a lot in this project. 
And we will have um, many opportunities in the future to talk about it and to say, well, look, I participated in this project two years ago, and I think it could be interesting for you. And kind of those kind of events also, like the COVID forum we had in, in Lyon in France uh, in September that is going uh, every year, it's very, very good opportunity because you have a lot of partners, a lot of people also facing, uh, well, the same issues, and sometimes they ju just don't know that there is a resource, that there is a tool, and I think it's uh, our responsibility, as well as partners, that we communicate, we disseminate, as Henning said, um, beyond the project. Uh, we have to remember as well that, um, you know, well, now we have organizations that are already really developed in applied research, but there might be, and there are some organizations in some countries that might not even know that it is a possibility. They might not even think it's, uh, it's happening and it's, that it's successful. And that's very important that we bring the knowledge also to them because they might not look for it if they don't know that it exists. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Myla. Today's discussion have uh, highlighted the critical importance of uh, research and innovation in VET from various angles. Uh, it's clear that uh, by working together, we can overcome challenges and unlock the full potential of VET uh, for future generations. Which are today's takeaways? To discuss these conclusions, we have the presence of uh, Jakubu, please, uh, Jakubu from Eurasia. Yes, thank you very much and uh, for, for all the moderation and for all the, all the voices that have happened here. Um, I think also when we were uh, you know, preparing this session and thinking about all what happened in the past two years, we were kind of uh, going into already a conclusion mindset. But as was just said before, it's not that the project ends and the whole outcomes of what we are discussing today will, will just finish. I think we are part of building the um, stronger and stronger and more relevant and the closer to the society VET, um, vet and, and then through VET, the applied research in VET, opportunities, reality, and simply the, um, the relevance for the economy and so on. We are seeing the political change. We are seeing also the, um, the changes in, 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 in our countries, the, the because caused by the, the global issues, by the crises, by the uh, labor market, by the economy changes. And we are seeing this relevance growing. We are seeing that being higher on the agenda. And I think we have to all contribute to make it even more higher, more relevant. And understand that it's not a silo thing that will allow our society to thrive because it's causing possibly some misunderstanding. It's, it's also not a competition. It's a, in, 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 in a true meaning of this fact. It's not a competition between the uh, universities in VET that should be fostered. It's more like understanding what is relevant for the different uh, regions and what's relevant for the different uh, for the different stages. It was said by by Inigo, our coordinator of, of Technica, and we are here in San Sebastian on our one of the on la last uh, meetings in person, and so that's why this panel is happening here. Um, that basically, it's all about recognizing the relevance. It's all about truly understanding the potential, but I don't think we have to be any more uh, uh, kind of uh, explaining that we are relevant. It's not the time anymore to say that, okay, VET, VAT, and therefore the careers in VET is something as a second tier. We are having many countries, many uh, stigma still in the year. We were having that for years, but it's not anymore. Uh, even some, somebody of you mentioned also careers, right? How the teachers want and how the teachers uh, are developing themselves what the opportunities for there. When it comes to the academic careers, the path is quite clear. Uh, what we are also advocating at Eurasia is uh, to foster um, the permeability between the labor market, academic careers, the professional education, and so on. If we would allow the system to be more flexible and allow uh, and attract the teachers for the applied uh, education through this kind of careers, for example, that would be another system uh, change and so on. So yeah, going through the conclusions, we were through the policy realities, the possibilities of suggestions for policymakers, I hope they are uh, listening to us, the opening of the funding opportunities, uh, the opening of the recognition of our, uh, of our sector in here, the relevance for all the levels, but uh, very much embedded in the local up to actually the global economy reality that, that we are facing now. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that the conclusion from now would be it's not finishing. We, we, are, we are there. The, 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 this part of the ecosystem will be, will be there for, for sure. So um, we will see what the 
what the bright future uh, brings into it, and we are looking forward for for its development. We are happy about the presence of more and more of that in the in the priorities of the countries of the European Commission funds, which is obviously also fostering our 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 European reality and our economy. So thanks very very much for moderation, and thanks for uh, host and all the guest partners as well, uh, who are who are um, guests of our our meeting here uh, at Erinvet in 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 Technica office. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for your participation, for your interesting contributions. And thank you also to all the attentive audience. We hope you enjoyed this session and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.